Oh, good morning, everyone. Welcome once again to Cosmic Coffee, coming to you on live stream here at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. I'm Jeff Hall. I'm an astronomer and the director of the observatory. Uh, with me here this morning, uh, uh, once again on Cosmic Coffee, is our deputy director for science, Michael West. Uh, welcome, Michael. And morning, Jeff. How are you doing? I'm I'm well. How are you doing? Pretty good. Good. Um, so as usual, we're going to start with a quick shout out to one of our local coffee shops. I'm enjoying some coffee uh, this morning from uh, Lux, which is a little shop down on Aspen Street on the south side between San Francisco and uh, Agassiz. I had a, a 7 a.m. meeting down there with uh, a colleague from around town, nice outside socially distanced chat, and we stopped in and got delicious coffee and 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 sugar and carbs and everything you need to, to help gets you through the day. Um, so today on Cosmic Coffee, we're going to um, go into a particular uh, interest of Michael's. Uh, you know, each week we talk about some topic having to do with either Lowell Observatory or different topics of astronomy. Today, we're going to talk about um, how other species see the stars, you know, and, and you know, obviously humans are interested in the night sky and have studied the night sky since our earliest ancestors. But, you know, every time I give a dark sky Talk. I always talk about the the impact of and the importance of preserving the night sky, not only for astronomy, uh, but for many other reasons, uh, including just human enjoyment of the night sky, but also because we, we know that a number of species rely on the natural dark sky for navigation. And, and so Michael has been looking into the question of how other species perceive the sky and what can they see and what they can't see. And we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. And I think the first thing is, Michael, just as a, a you know, a garden variety astronomer who specializes in, um, you know, galactic evolution and structure, what, what got you interested in, in this? Good <laughs> question. Um, yeah, so I should make clear, Jeff, I am not an expert on this. I'm just curious. So I just, I, you know, I'm happy to share what little bit I, I know about this. But I think there's two things that sort of got me interested one is, um, I don't know if you can see my slide, this, this guy here is, is my dog, Max. And I walk Max every night. And yeah, as you know, in Flagstaff, we have really dark skies. So we see the Milky Way every night. The moon will be up sometimes. Um, there'll be a shooting star occasionally. Max couldn't care less. And so and the Lord knows I've tried to get him interested in something that's going on in the sky. And he has no interest. And I started wondering, maybe he can't see anything up there. I don't know how his eyesight is, right? So I got sort of curious. Um, and the other thing that really intrigued me was I read an article a few years ago about whales. And the idea that could whales possibly use the stars or the sun or the moon to navigate? It's well known that certain types of whales, humpback whales, gray whales, others, uh, navigate over enormous distances, thousands of miles. And there have been a few studies that have shown that um, they go in remarkably straight lines. Here's a paper that was published a few years ago. And those little colored dots you see, so what they did was they, they tagged whales with um, um, GPS systems, essentially. So they would know where they were at, at every moment along their journey. And you see that in general, the whales go in these incredibly straight lines. These are whales um, that were migrating from the coast of Brazil down, you know, down towards yeah. colder um, Antarctic waters, basically. And you see that in general, they go in these remarkably straight lines. And in fact, these studies showed that the whales can travel enormous distances without varying by more than a few degrees from a perfectly straight line. And so the question is, how do they do that? And we know that there's species that um, use the Earth's magnetic field, for example. There's birds and, and other creatures that do that. And can whales do that? Do they use the magnetic field of the Earth? Or could they use stars, possibly, to navigate? We know humans have done that uh, for, for forever. Um, and the, the fact that there might be a connection between whales and um, celestial markers uh, was reinforced recently by studies that showed, uh, as you know, unfortunately, whales are, are known to beach uh, sometimes. They, they, they go ashore where they, they unfortunately die. And there was a really interesting study uh, 
earlier this year that found a really clear correlation between activity from the sun and whales beaching themselves. <laughs> and the theory is that the whales may somehow be using the Earth's magnetic field. These, these are gray whales in particular. They might be using the Earth's magnetic field to navigate along magnetic field lines. And when there's a lot of activity in the sun, I mean, you know this, you work on the sun, Jeff. When there's a lot of activity uh, on the sun, like, like in this image, uh, charged particles, uh, protons, okay. electrons, they slam into the Earth's atmosphere a few days later, and they can disrupt the Earth's magnetic field briefly. It produces things like the northern lights, for example. Yep. And so the fact that there was this observed correlation between activity on the sun and then a short time later, whales beaching themselves, sounds like they got disoriented, that somehow the Earth's magnetic field got disrupted. But that seems to apply to, in particular to gray whales. And I was sort of intrigued by the possibility that uh, other whales, uh, like humpback whales in particular, might actually be stargazers. So this shows uh, behavior that humpback whales are known to do, uh, which is called spy hopping. And they seem to poke their heads out of the water and look or listen, uh, they sort of tread water there basically. Oops, sorry. And this is seen in other species too. Orca whales, for example, are known to do this. In the case of orcas, they're probably listening for seals and other things they like to eat. But humpbacks are the bigger question and whether they might be um, using the stars to navigate, much as a, a humans did for, for thousands and thousands of years, right? We could navigate. Well, and still do. You know, there's well, exactly. That's right. On the images. Where, um, where the stars rise and set and that sort of thing. So could whales be doing the same thing? So that, those are the two things that really got me kind of intrigued uh, about this possibility of, uh, you know, just kind of curious what do animals see? Can whales even see the stars? Can my dog see the stars? Can your cat see the stars? So I just started reading way too much on this because I was <laughs> really intrigued by it. No, it is interesting. And, you know, I certainly agree that I think the complementary example that I specifically use in the Dark Sky Talks concerns uh, sea turtles, you know, and, and sea turtle nesting areas are one of the areas where the at least in past years, the low pressure sodium lighting that we use in Flagstaff for dark sky um, control is, is widely used because it's this monochromatic light. And the reason being, you know, the sea turtle hatchlings use the natural light from the sky reflecting on the ocean to guide them that way. Yeah. And when there's lots of brighter artificial lights the wrong way, you know, on the other side of the beach from developments or whatever, they go the wrong way and they all they all die. So we, we clearly know that animals perceive this and, and use this. Um, but then I guess the question is, you know, we're, we're not uh, a humpback whale. So how, how do we, how do we even approach the idea of what an animal actually sees? You asked me, asked them very nicely. No, um, that's a really good question, right? Cause you can't ask them. You can't have them sit down and visit the optometrist and take a test for example. But there are some ways you can figure out what animals can see. And one, of course, is just physiology. You know, if you look at you and me and humans, we can see the stars and we can see the stars because of the way our, our eyes work. We have these rods and cones. Cones allow us to see fine detail and color, but we don't have very many of them relative to the rods. Rods can't perceive color, but they can perceive lower levels of light and they're scattered all over the inside of our eyes. And so we use these rods and cones to um, see the world around us. And by the same kind of uh, rationale, you can figure out the number of rods and cones that make up different eyes of different kinds of animals. For example, you can actually measure these things, right? So this, for example, is a cow's eye, right? So you can actually count rods and cones if you want and get a sense of how good would their seeing be, how much detail could they see? Again, it's the cones the, that allow you to see the, the fine details, like the pixels in your camera. The more pixels you have, the more uh, fine detail you can make out in your photograph. Same thing with your eyes. The more cones you have, the more detail you can see. So how many cones does a cow have in its eye? How many cones does a fish have in its eye? How many rods? That determines how well it can see in, in low light levels. And so those are the kind of things that you can do. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can actually do uh, experiments with uh, animals. They've done these experiments with horses, for example, or with birds, where they'll get a treat 
if they can resolve certain numbers of lines on an image, for example. Um, so there's ways to figure out what's what's called their visual acuity, their ability to make out fine detail. Right. Uh, so there are ways you can figure these things out. Yeah, it seems like there's there's two uh, critical parameters here. You know, there's you know we rely heavily, of course, on our ability to detect color, but really in, in interpreting or or using what's in the sky, it's that resolution and your ability to resolve detail, which is, you know, clearly is a, a critical parameter for any astronomical research telescope, but also for an eye. Exactly. And, and if you look at a whale, for example, a whale has some unique challenges because it spends part of its time above water, right? They're air breathing mammals. Uh, but then they also plunge to tremendous depths where there's less light and the pressure is great on their bodies and their eyes. So their eyes have to be really, really adapted to quite diverse conditions. So could they see the stars? You know, if you and I go underwater and you open your eyes, everything's blurry and out of focus. So what does a whale see? Does it see well underwater yeah. or does it see well above water? And I'm not an expert on this again, but my reading suggests that, in fact, they're able to, you know, you and I can squint, right? If you can't see, if you can't bring something into focus, you squint, yeah. you right. change the shape of your eye. And whales can do that too, better than us. And so it's plausible that they're able to squint when they're out of the water, for example, spy hopping, to actually see things that are above the water surface. Uh, but it's, it's some pretty unique challenges for whales to be able to see in the really low light levels where they dive to great depths and then up in the bright sunlight when they come up for air. It's, it's quite a challenge. Yeah, and actually, I, in looking back through past cosmic copies, I've noticed Notice myself doing the same thing when we, we read in the questions from the chat feed. You know, I have two ways of doing it. I can put on my reading glasses. But I've noticed sometimes I'm sitting there like this, and it's not because I'm, like, really angry at the viewer. It's just that I'm, I'm squinting so my, my pathetic old eyes can see what's going on. Exactly. Um, so if you're a whale, it would be even harder. Right. And clearly, you know, every species will develop differently. Um, I mean, we see this the classic thing where, you know, predator animals – have this and prey animals have the really wide, yeah. wide set eyes. So maybe let's let's go through a couple of species and um, talk about what they see. So while we were setting up for the, the stream, of course, I was trying to get ready for the stream, but also dealing with a very loudly mewing cat in the room. And, and you've talked about Max and, you know, I don't know, uh, maybe he just wasn't exposed to enough science as a puppy or something <laughs> and is interested in shooting stars. But why don't we start with cats and dogs and, and what do they actually see when they're out on a walk with us. So cats and dogs, the bottom line is they would make really lousy astronomers. <laughs> um, they have uh, many more rods than you and I do. And again, it's the rods that allow you to see faint light levels. Also, like in the case of a cat, for example, a cat's pupils are actually 50% bigger than yours and mine. That's why, you know, you see the cats with these gigantic yeah, pupils yeah. sometimes. So they can generally see in lower light levels, sort of five times lower light levels than you or I could see it. But because they have more rods, they have fewer cones. The cones, again, are those, they're the pixels of your eye that let you see the details. And so they don't have the visual acuity. They can't see the fine detail that you and I can see. And what that means basically is that your cat has difficulty seeing anything further away. And, and the same is true for your dog. So this, for example, shows um, a scene that you and I might see at the top, a cityscape, right? And we can see far away, we can make out all the different buildings and everything. And this is what your poor cat sees, which is probably wondering why it's at the top of a tall building anyway. Um, they just can't see any level of detail when things are more than say roughly 20 or, or 30 um, feet away. So in fact, if you went to the optometrist and you have good eyesight, your eyesight as a human would be 20-20. Your cat's eyesight would be roughly 20-100. What that means is it's something that you could easily see from 100 feet away, your cat would have to get right up close to it, 20 feet away to be able to see it. So that explains why my, my poor dog, Max, can't see the stars and your cat can't see the stars because they're just fuzzing out of focus for them. They don't bring in any detail. This is what your dog would see compared to you. Uh, and again, cats and dogs are also sort of red, green, colorblind. They don't see the range of colors that you and I are able to see either. 
Um, the good news is it means your dog will never get a driver's license <laughs> because they're legally blind in most states. Um, but it also means when you think your dog is really happy to see you, they're not. They're really happy to smell you because they can't see you when you're very far away. They don't know it's you, uh, but they can smell you, right? Um, so if I want Max to see the stars, I'm going to have to invest in some glasses for Max, and hopefully he'd be able to see them. But it, it makes sense then why um, you're – Max has no interest in looking at the stars. He just doesn't see them. In principle, he can see the moon, right? This big bright thing in the sky, but he also doesn't seem curious about that. Yeah, yeah. So are, are there any states where a dog could legally drive? That would be an interesting map. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I don't know. I'll research that one next. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that, that seems kind of a pity. I mean, cats obviously seem to have a lot of acuity. And, and, uh, but, um, so how about, let's, let's say, maybe horses, uh, sort of a, a so horses are the opposite. Horses have great uh, vision, actually. Um, their eyes are really comparable to yours and mine. The difference, as you mentioned earlier, is that they've got eyes on, on both sides of their head, right? Uh, years ago, when Herman Melville wrote uh, Moby Dick, he commented the same thing. How do whales perceive the world with eyes on opposite sides of their head? Mm -hmm. And so for a horse, what it means is they have what's called monocular vision. They can look in both directions and they can only see binocular like you and I can to gauge depth in a narrow region in front of them. Uh, but in general, their eyes are really good. They've got uh, big eyes uh, and they have uh, enough cones that they're able to see quite a bit of detail. So in fact, if you went to the optometrist with your horse and they don't encourage that, you'd find that your horse's vision is very similar to human vision. If you and I have good 20-20 vision, your horse would be sort of 20-25. So in principle, horses could be astronomers. They don't have opposable thumbs and that kind of thing, so it makes it a little hard to build telescopes. But nonetheless, their vision is actually really good. Uh, let alone write papers. So to be <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, with, with one hoof on the keyboard. Um, well, the, all right, that's, that's right. So yeah, and so the stereo vision then is just, just limited to this extremely, you see right. the pictures of the overlapping fields of view. Exactly. Uh, which I guess is what the, probably what the blinders are for. They just sort of forces the horse to focus in where it has a little bit of. Uh, and, and again, it's an interesting question. Again, like I was saying, Herman Melville sort of said, how do, how do they perceive the world, right? You see these two completely opposite views and your brain is somehow able to process them at the same time. It's really fascinating. Right. Yeah. You know, we have all the, the mule deer who live up here on Mars Hill. And of course it's the same thing. You know, they're just, they've obviously got, to completely opposite views on the world. And yeah, you wonder how, how their brains stitch that into a composite image, which exactly. I mean, it's gotta be a vital defense mechanism to avoid predators. In the Maybe way. they're much smarter than us, I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, looking at the average deer, I could certainly believe that. Um, <laughs> all right, so you know, when, when we talk about um, dark skies and um, casualties to uh, animal populations from the loss of dark sky or artificial light at night, as we sometimes call it, you know, birds and insects figure really prominently because the, the amount of bird deaths as well as insect deaths per year is enormous from, from poor outdoor lighting. And you might say, well, all right, birds and insects, but remember, you know, this is a critical part of the ecological web on which our food supply relies, you know, and, and the articles you read about the loss of insect population, it's not just dead bugs. It, it's actually quite important. This is a grand interlocked system. So let's, how, how do birds and insects apprehend what's up there? Yeah. So, so that, that's a good point, Jeff. You know, years ago I lived in Toronto and I remember, uh, you know, the, the skyscrapers are lit up at night, right? And the, the birds would fly into them during the night and every morning they would go out and they would literally sweep up the dead birds. It was just tragic, you know, and as you say, with insects and everything. Um, it, it turns out that birds and insects have quite different uh, visions of the sky, if you will. Uh, in general, many birds have really exquisite vision, of course. Uh, an ostrich, for example, has an, an eye that's five times bigger than your or my eye. So they have really, really good vision. Whether they can see the stars, in principle, probably. Um, and for sure, owls, as we all know, owls have great vision, which they use to, um, you know, hunt prey, for example, in, in, at night. Uh, and their eyes, so, so an owl's head is about the size of your fist, 
but their eyes are as big as yours. And so they have really, really exquisite eyesight. In fact, I often think that the owls must pity us because the sky must just be alive with stars at night oh, for them. And, and clearly, it's like, you know, our poor little eyes, you know. Yeah, clearly set there for just magnificent stereo vision. Um, yeah. And, yeah. So, so they have really great eyes. So like I said, the, the night sky must just be, you know, otherworldly for them. Wow. Yep. Yeah. But there have been some experiments that were done to actually test whether some birds navigate by the stars. For example, in the 1950s, there were experiments done by a, a German or Austrian uh, scientist uh, named Sauer, and he actually brought uh, a type of bird called a European warbler into a planetarium, didn't charge him admission or anything. And he did his experiments to see did they recognize the night sky and use it to fly in certain directions? And the answer was yes. And the way he did this was actually really clever. Uh, he put the birds in a little sort of box or container with essentially an ink pad at the bottom. And when the sky was visible overhead, when the stars would appear in the planetarium, the birds would try to fly in particular directions based on where the stars were. So you can see where their feet would go as they tried to take off and fly. And he discovered that yes, the birds were trying to use the stars to orient themselves to the fly in certain directions. If you turn the lights off, you know, if you pretended it was cloudy in the planetarium, the birds got disoriented and they didn't know which way to go. So that, that's pretty amazing. Um, uh, other uh, experiments were done as well with indigo buntings and other types of birds that also found that they seem to learn which star is the North Star, mm. right? If you go back in, you know, tragic part of American history with the, the Underground Railroad and, 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 and slaves escaping to the North using the North Star to figure the direction, um, some of these birds do the same thing. They learn to recognize that the whole sky appears to spin around one particular special star, the North Star, and they use that to know which direction is north. And in fact, in these experiments, these were done in the 1970s by a scientist at Cornell University, uh, if you change the North Star, which you can do in a planetarium, you can make the sky rotate around any star you like, um, the birds would use that. Right? So, for example, in some of these experiments, young birds were trained or taught, if you like, not that Polaris was a North Star, but to say Betelgeuse was a North Star. And they would use that and think that was a direction north. So clearly there are some species of birds that use the stars to navigate, to migrate over uh, great distances. Um, insects, so, so in general, birds have, you know, really, really exquisite eyesight. Insects are another whole thing. Um, insects have really crummy eyesight in general. Uh, they've got these kinds of eyes, uh, like you see in, in this image, that uh, allow them to see, it's like a mosaic, it allows them to see in, it is called compound eyes, allows them to see in many different directions simultaneously, which is why it's hard to catch up on a fly and swat it if you're trying to do that. But, it has really poor resolution. So this little picture here shows how you or I might perceive a butterfly's wing and then how an insect like this might perceive it. It just, it doesn't have very sharp vision at all. Low res. Very low res. And so what that means is uh, something like this, uh, where you would see this in, I'm sorry, let me just fix this really quick. Um, so something like this, where you or I would see the stars that look like this, an insect with its really low res eyes would see something that looks like this. It would pick out the brightest regions. It would notice there are slight variations in the brightness across the sky, but it could never make out individual stars, for example. So that's not necessarily a huge disadvantage. You may have heard about these, these dung beetles, which are found in South Africa and, and, and other regions. So dung beetles, as the name suggests, their favorite meal is dung. Uh, and they're really unkind to each other. So when there's a big steaming pile of dung and everybody says, mm, dinner, um, they try and steal it from each other. And it's like a humble existence. <laughs> yeah, that's right. 
Um, and so what happens is when they make a little ball of dung, they want to get away from their, their other dung beetles as quick as possible so nobody can steal it from them. And they did these experiments that found that although dung beetles, like in, most insects have really crummy eyesight, they can still make out the band of light, the Milky Way overhead. And they use that as kind of a marker to figure out the quickest way to get out of where they are, to get away as quick as possible in a straight line. Because if you meander, odds are you're gonna bump into another insect and the dung beetle is gonna try and steal your, your meal. Um, so they did these experiments also in a planetarium where you have the Milky Way overhead, this faint band of light that they can't make out the individual stars or any structure, but they see this faint glow overhead. Um, and if you turn that off in the planetarium, the dung beetles just kind of went around at random. They didn't go in straight lines anymore. And they even did these experiments, and I don't know how you do this, but they put little hats on the dung beetles so they couldn't see the Milky Way overhead. And they got disoriented again. They didn't really go in a straight line to escape. So, you know, insects in general, really, because of their compound eyes, they really can't see the stars, but they can still make out kind of patchy, very general differences. So if the moon is up, for example, they would see this kind of glow from the moon overhead, that kind of thing. Well, that that's very interesting. I must say in, um, you know, 30 years as a practicing professional scientist, I have never asked myself the question, how do you put a hat on a dung beetle? But we can <laughs> miss it out. <laughs> leave that as a question for our viewers and, and maybe they can email in some answers from, from the internet as to how you do that. Um, so we've got um, a comment and a question and then uh, can move on to one more, I think, critically important species. I do want to mention though, what you point out about insect resolution. Certainly, you know, you can see why in light polluted areas with both the general sky dome, uh, light dome over a city, as well as all the bright points, say a ball field or a bright skyscraper, the sky is gonna be this, this mosaic of light and dark areas that obviously would profoundly impact um, how, how insects move and navigate at night. Yeah. Yep. All right, so one, one comment from DJ Shuby04 writes, there's a neighborhood cat that usually joins me when I have my telescope out, but he never looks up. And, and <laughs> gotta I, talk to him. But, <laughs> right now you know why, right? Yeah, Maybe right can, now you know why. Change the focus on the telescope. I don't know. Right, or, or yeah, change the focus on the cat or something. Or, <laughs> um, yeah. um, and so, actually, Jonathan Ford has a, a good question here, um, saying concerning avian navigation, um, will do anomalies in the Earth's electromagnetic field disrupt migrations? And I think maybe referring to the wandering of the North Magnetic Pole. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I, I emphasize some of these birds that use the stars, but clearly there are many that also use the Earth magnetic field lines, right? They've got these, um, these um, sort of semi-magnetic crystals in their beaks uh, that are actually able to detect the Earth's magnetic field. Um, and I, I, again, I'm not an expert on this at all, but I think actually more birds use that as far as we know at the moment, use the Earth's magnetic field than use the stars. And yes, you know, there's evidence of the Earth's magnetic field moves and, and the field even flips. Uh, and uh, that in principle, sure, I mean, the, what is it, the Earth's magnetic field, the magnetic north is moving from like Canada to Siberia at the moment or something like that. Um, and I guess in principle, if the field lines move with it, uh, it may change that change slightly. But if you think about so many of these species have probably been around for, for you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of years and Presumably these things have happened during that time and somehow they're able to adjust, but I honestly don't know. Yeah. 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 No, the, the motion of the magnetic field is very real. And, you know, you see it even in practical human applications, right? I mean, we, we can't travel now, but we can, um, you know, have to fly around a lot. And I can think of a couple of airports where the, the runway numbering has changed um, yeah. since I started flying because the runway numbers are, of course, just the, the magnetic heading with a zero dropped yeah. and it moves around and it changes the, the heading that you're on when you're flying into the same runway, the magnetic heading, um, which is very interesting. It'd be interesting to have these little sensors in our noses, I think. Would well, there was a, actually there was an article a year or so ago that actually suggested that humans might have a very, very subtle ability to detect the magnetic field of the earth. They put people in Faraday cages. That must be a lot of fun. No, uh, not, and they oh. found that uh, that they, the suggestion was, again, be really, really faint, but that we might be able to detect the Earth's magnetic field ourselves. 
Well, I personally have never noticed it. Maybe it's too much caffeine obscuring it as we go. Um, all right. Well, I think it's certainly a question that must be burning on everybody's mind um, in terms of how we perceive the universe. Perhaps some of the most important species we know of, of course, aliens. So, so I, I mean, yeah, for me, the, the thing about aliens is, uh, you know, who, who knows if they exist for one thing, right? But if you look at our planet and you find that, as far as we can tell, some species can see the stars, like some of these birds. Many species can't. In fact, there was a re- I should mention there was a really interesting study uh, done by researchers at Duke University back in 2018, and they did it was sort of a meta study. They pulled together published papers on 600 different species on our planet, and they found that the visual acuity, the ability to see the stars or to see details, varied by sort of a factor of 10,000 from the species with the best seeing versus the worst seeing. And so if you think about our planet, right, my dog can't see the stars, but some birds can, apes can, apes have very similar eyesight to you and I, uh, but they're not astronomers. And so if you imagine another world with a different home star, with different atmosphere with different conditions. What's the likelihood that an intelligent alien species will evolve with A, the ability to see the stars, and then B, the curiosity about the stars to maybe want to travel out there someday. If you look at our planet, we're the only ones that seem interested as far as we can tell, and admittedly that's a bias, in building telescopes and in some day traveling uh, among the stars. And so who, who knows what this says about other worlds, right? Where, you know, conditions could just be really, really different, for example. So that's a really interesting question. You know, I've, I've occasionally, previously, I've thought about, you know, what would be the, the, the impacts, say, on our uh, culture and philosophy, even, even religious development, say, if Earth were shrouded in a perpetual overcast, right? And our ancestors had never even been able to see the stars, Exactly. But, you know, you, you raise another question I haven't thought about before, which is on a, on a world like that, that somehow had a, a climate that allowed life to develop, you know, would the, the absence of very fine pinpricks all over the sky actually affect evolution and how that species de- de- evolves and develops its eyesight? An interesting point, and I, I don't know the answer. Well, just like if you think about navigation again, some of these birds that migrate, for example, that's key to their species and presumably to its survival, the ability to go, you know, um, to breed and to feed and to do all that stuff. And that would, the inability to see the stars would definitely have an impact on them. A really interesting question coming in from our regular viewer, David Connell. Good morning, David. Um, and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe this happened, but David asked or says it would have been fun to have had a, quote, conversation with Coco the gorilla as to whether stars were of interest. Do you know if anybody ever did something like that? No, that's a fascinating question, though. I should, I, I'm going to look that up because I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, in principle, Coco or any any ape can see the stars. Their eyes are really similar to ours. Um, are they curious? Do they, do they like I, I always say, you know, apes don't, don't, don't make telescopes, right? They don't seem to have this curiosity about the stars, but whether they're even aware of them or perceive them, um, it would be a fascinating question. And the fact that you could communicate with Coco or, or some of these other apes would be really fascinating to ask. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna research that. Yeah, or even perhaps like some of the, the very intelligent aquatic species like dolphins. I mean, you know, it, it, I, I, I'm not at all an expert on, on how how far we've developed efforts to do rudimentary communication. I know Coco could, you know, deliver all those signs, but, you know, there's been, I know work done with dolphins and, and. Um, I mean, for example, like, like David was asking, you know, just to ask Coco, you know, what are stars or do you see, you know, what are those points in the sky? Right. Of light? That, that would be fascinating actually. Yep. Yep. And you can certainly imagine that the, these, these species <laughs> in many ways, so similar to us, you know, might observe how the sky changes over the course of the year, you know, just like humans do to time the seasons and, and, you know, crop plantings and all of that. It's, it's not at all a stretch to imagine, imagine that animals do that as well. Yeah, exactly. 
But yeah, so it raised an interesting question about aliens then, you know, will they be curious about the stars? Can they see the stars? As you said, maybe they live on a really shrouded planet. Who knows? Right, right. Or do they evolve in a way that, you know, they perceive and sense the universe in ways fundamentally different to our five senses? I mean, well, they might, you know, we, as you know, you and I see visible light because that's what the sun shines most brightly. It emits that kind of light that illuminates right. our world. It could be elsewhere, you know, you have infrared eyes or you have some other kinds of eyes for other types of species. To detect the right. And, and, our, and our lens to that is so distorted. Like even the, you know, the alien you showed on your alien title slide is, you know, I mean, topologically, it's just a morphed human, right? It's got two eyes, nostrils, and a mouth. I mean, of course, it's a person, albeit not by our standards, maybe the most photogenic one. You know, who knows what incredible uh, varieties genuinely alien life might take. So we'll, what we'll do at this point is ask for any, a few, any, uh, if the viewers have any final questions. Um, any comments, Michael, to summarize or, or, or wrap up? This has been really, really interesting, and I hope our viewers have enjoyed it. I'm going to start a Kickstarter to get glasses for my dog so you can see the stars. There you go. <laughs> so we'll, we'll take just a minute um, to see if there are any final questions. I would like to note, um, so we will be back next week with another episode of Cosmic Coffee. And we're going to be here um, with our uh, Lowell project manager, Dave Sawyer. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about instrument building because um, he was, before he came to Lowell, he was deeply involved with the development of our Planet Hunter Spectrograph Express. And that's kind of a nice tie-in to finishing uh, this show with aliens um, because, you know, with Express, we are, we are looking for potentially habitable planets around sun-like stars. And, and the most recent data that have come in from Express are fabulously precise. And, and it really is the most powerful spectrograph telescope combination in the world for hunting for these tiny little planets around stars trillions of miles away. And the question is, how do you build an instrument that can um, detect those? Um, and so, so we're getting ready to sign off. There is one more comment that, that came in and I, yep. And I'm, I'm sure you know this one, uh, Michael, this is from Nayla Irwin who points out there's a wonderful science fiction story by Isaac Asimov, Nightfall, that addresses a slightly different idea that night only happens once in 2000 years. Okay. I remember reading that story. And again, oh, like right. your perpetually shrouded planet, that would also profoundly change, right? How you interpret your universe. That's right. As you say, if you think about all the different forms that other planets could take, right? Different conditions, whatever vision, whatever that even means could, could be incredibly different. You know, if you think about whales and some of them use sonar, for example, to na or navigate their way around, maybe there's other worlds where there aren't even eyes, right? <laughs> right, right. And I mean, even if, even in our own solar system, like the, the next planet in Venus, I mean, we, we, you know, we couldn't exist on Venus as it, as it is presently, but suppose you could, you know, Venus is very close to being tidally locked. And so, you know, it's, it's year is whatever it is, 200, 20 some days and the day is very comparable. So if you lived on Venus, it, it would, it would be going in the direction of nightfall. You know, the sun would just inch around the sky. Or think about, you know, the moons Europa or Titan in our own solar system where astronomers think there could be life. Um, but you know, they're not going to have eyes that see the stars right on, on Europa. For example, the belief is that there's an icy layer, an icy crust and maybe a, a an ocean below those things aren't going to see this, whatever, if there's anything there, they're not going to see the stars probably. Right. And it, it's, I, I guess, similar to species that, that exist in the deepest trenches of, of our own oceans, right? Either, you know, they've got these ghastly eyes because there's, you know, or, or, or none at all. They, they just evolve in very different ways. Or, or fish in general, because I mean, they're used to seeing underwater. Once you try and look out of the water, it's, it's all blurry. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, all fascinating to ponder. And um, we hope everybody's enjoyed today's episode. Um, so we'll be back um, next week to talk about the, the, the ultimate in precision uh, instrument building. Until then, everybody, as always, stay healthy and safe. We hope you're, you're all doing well during the, the pandemic and enjoy your, your occasional sojourns online with us here at Lowell Observatory. So until then, we'll see you and have a great weekend. All right. Thank you.